Hi there, it's Stephanie, and welcome to Translating Everything. Today we'll answer, did John Leguizamo just spoil the ending of The Power? In a breakdown of his most iconic characters, John Alberto Leguizamo's description for his most recent show, The Power, may have let the electric cat out of the bag for how the show will eventually end. In Amazon's nine-part global thriller, The Power, Sustained and elevated estrogen causes people across the world to develop a new organ capable of producing and conducting electricity. Younger people can awaken the power in older people. Soon enough, most women can do it. Sooner still, non-binary and gender non-conforming people reveal they got the power too. And with that comes a startling reversal in gender-based power dynamics, and the revelation that how the world responds may merely repeat the mistakes of the past. The book tells us how it all turns out, but the show? We have to listen to John Leguizamo, spilling more spoilers than Tom Holland. John Leguizamo is a treasure, trove of spoilers. For the power, the difference between the book and the show, at least for now, is that the book is over. It has an ending. Whether the show continues past these nine episodes and goes the distance, the book tells us what's most likely to happen. And then there's John Leguizamo, who plays the main character, Rob Cleary Lopez. He just released a video with GQ, in which it seems absurdly likely he spoiled a huge part of how the show will end. It was an innocent error, but it's a kind of image and word association that I just can't see him make, without it being the equivalent of a Freudian slip. Please don't remind me that Freudian slips are long since debunked. So the cataclysm, how the book ends versus how the show might end. The novel ends just as something awful happens. That awful thing is called the cataclysm. What exactly is the cataclysm? Is it nuclear war, something else? A quote from the ancient one gives subtle hints. He's a dummy at math, but a genius at innovative hairstyles, and that man's name is Albert Einstein. Albert Einstein said, I know not what with I know not with what weapons World War Three will be fought, but World War Four will be fought with sticks and stones. The novel ends without telling readers who caused the cataclysm or even what truly happened to send humanity back to the Stone Age. Instead, the final pages of the novel leap from one era on the brink of an apocalypse to thousands of years later, when society has rebuilt itself into a replica of the one we see today, but with one difference. Because people with elevated estrogen tended to develop active skeins and that super cool ability to generate and conduct electricity, the power dynamic reversed. Rather than discard the strict father ideology, that led to so much war and strife. Society reshaped itself under the same ideals, the same standards, the same patriarchy, by any other name. The patriarchy reshaped itself into a matriarchy. In the future of the power, women don't rule with any less evil than men ever did. In the future of the power, the same toxic culture that elevated people with elevated testosterone now reserves power for those with elevated estrogen. Season one is only halfway over, and John Leguizamo may have already spoiled the ending. At the time of this writing, Amazon has only aired the first five episodes. They've yet to announce whether the show has been renewed for a second season. Audiences are hungry to know how this season will end, and whether the season finale must be taken as a series finale. But while audiences go full Westworld in deciphering clues to foreshadow the plot, Look at the chess pieces for the biggest clues. One of the stars of the show may have already spoiled how the power will end. In his video with GQ, John Leguizamo breaks down his most iconic characters. The spoiler comes near the end when he's discussing the power. It's a blink and you'll miss it moment. You'd have to be obsessed with the show to even think it means anything. Uh, well, just for the record, Stephanie Mayster is obsessed with Namiel Alderman's book and the trans allied sci-fi series of power. There we go, just to make it official. The GQ video is worth watching for more than what Leguizamo says about the power. First of all, John Leguizamo chats about his early role as Luigi 
in the live action Super Mario Brothers movie are just delightful. Second of all, I loved his comments on John Wick. He says the script gave him zero indication how awesome the movie would be. He didn't know until he saw the finished movie and was blown away like everyone else. And then when he discusses Tu Wong Fu, my God, he did another interview with The Independent where he acknowledges that Chi Chi is clearly trans, not a drag queen. And if the movie were made today, he would want the character PV to be both explicitly trans and played by a trans actress. Now I see why John Leguizamo was perfect to play the role of Rob in The Power. As far as The Power, his breakdown video for GQ goes over the early scene between Rob and Jocelyn when they're in the car and her power short circuits the radio. You should watch the full video, but here's just one line I want to draw your attention to. He says, and the organ, like the brain, like the eyes, gives off an electrical charge. But if they can focus and learn how to use it, it can make like a nuclear blast. So let's explain the cataclysm and why John Leguizamo's comment might indicate more than it seems. Because holy shit, John. Let me explain the difference. Of, the, let me explain the significance of what he said. Uh, but before that, a warning, okay? I will be spoiling certain parts of the end of the novel, The Power, that the show's based on. The show has already made some adaptation decisions that mean it literally cannot be a word for word adaptation of the book. But that doesn't mean it won't borrow different pieces that I might mention. So if you want to skip the spoilers, you need to stop listening or reading right now. I've got a link for you to follow that shows John Leguizamo in his early role as Luigi in Super Mario Brothers, the live action movie. Otherwise, here we begin book spoilers for The Power, explaining the cataclysm. At the end of The Power, forces across the world have taken shape in everything we dreamed Game of Thrones would become. In one section of the world, men still have power, and they are threatening to send nukes. Sorry to skip that, y'all. Hold on, y'all. In other parts of the, in one section of the world, men still have power, and they are threatening to send nukes. In other parts of the world, almost every main character we've met in the show is either hiding out from the coming war or taking direct steps to initiate that war. That war is called the Cataclysm. The book doesn't really explain what happened in the Cataclysm. That's, in fact, part of the conceit of the novel. It's told from the POV of Neil, a writer attempting to reconstruct what happened thousands of years after the novel begins. The epilogue states, for one thing, of course, we don't have original manuscripts dating back more than a thousand years. All the books we have from before the Cataclysm have been recopied hundreds of times. That's a lot of occasions for errors to be introduced, and not just errors. All of the copyists would have had their own agendas. For more than 2,000 years, the only people recopying were nuns in convents. I don't think it's at all a stretch to suggest that they picked works to copy that supported their viewpoint and just let the rest molder into flakes of parchment. I mean... Why would they recopy works that said that men used to be stronger and women weaker? That would be heresy, and they'd be damned for it. That is the trouble with history. You cannot see what's there. You cannot see what's not there. You can look at an empty space and see what's missing, but there's no way to know what was. I'm just drawing in the blank spaces. It's not an attack. Now, what the hell led to that kind of twisted future? One that seems so similar to our own and yet has been flipped. Let's get more specific about little details from the book. These are not huge spoilers, but they are quite big if you care about anything being spoiled at all. As the different chess pieces across the world make their final moves, Jocelyn reads new updates on her cell phone and they are horrifying. War is brewing across the world, but it's getting particularly feisty in Eastern Europe. The South Moldovans, that's Besapara, run by Tatiana. They are winning. They're fighting the North, North Moldovans, that's the old regime, run by men. And the Saudis may be involved somehow. Now, did any of you read Manhunt by Gretchen Felker Martin? Remember the armies of turfs that went around castrating and murdering anyone they declared didn't count as human? In Manhunt, the armies of turfs killed whoever fit their definition of men. Unfortunately, that would have included trans women like Sister Maria. In The Power, the turfs take a gender-reverse shape. 
Tatiana's nation of Besapara is running experiments on boys born with skeins in order to understand and control the power. They are cutting open boys with skeins in order to find out what's happening to them. Then they're feeding them big glops of glitter. That's the drug that some say is like cocaine. It seems to fix or enhance a person's skein, but you quickly become dependent on it. Others, of course, say that patriarchal bullshit. Gender-affirming medical care is simply what some people need to be whole. It's urban docs or sites like that who tell girls that the purple-white powder makes girls with skein abnormalities worse. It increases the highs and the lows, they say. Your system becomes dependent on it. But they're the kind of, that's the kind of bullshit a man would say to keep you from accepting good medical care. No one knows for sure, but people are pretty sure. The North Moldovans are funded by the House of Saudi in exile. They think this war with Besapara may be a proving ground for an attempt to retake Saudi Arabia. Tunde reports that Urban Docs has joined up with Babe Truth, y'all, LOL, these names, but I guess Reddit and 4chan were taken, and they are threatening to send nukes. Jocelyn may be reading about all of this stuff on her cell phone, but she also becomes a big player in the North Star Wars, and that means that while she doesn't die, she does become a kind of, of casualty. Margot, her mother, will never see anyone hurt Mark or Jocelyn again. And that is what leads me to ask, does Margot cause the cataclysm? Some readers believe Ali causes the cataclysm. There's good evidence for this in the novel, least of all, Ali herself. But there are other candidates for who sends the first missile. Margot is a mama bear who refuses to ever see her daughter hurt again. This is what the show is setting up in episode five, when Jocelyn convinced her mom to finally activate her own skein. Jocelyn showed her mom that this power is a gift, and then people hurt Jocelyn in a way Margot will never forgive. In a way, Margot will never let that happen again. She goes on TV and tells the world about Jocelyn's injuries, but she doesn't stop there. She adds, terrorism can strike anywhere, at home or abroad. The most important thing is that our enemies, both global and domestic, must know that we are strong and that we will retaliate. Margot speaks to the president about new research proving domestic and international threats of terrorism. This is Game of Thrones taken to its ultimate end. Urban Doc threatens end to end. Urban Throat, let me see what I wrote here. Urban Doc's threatens to end what they see as an eternal winter by sending their version of dragons, nuclear missiles. Marco believes that the United States must appear strong. The United States must act now. Now here is where shit gets weird. The book isn't clear what the voice is. In the show, Allie appears to have first heard the voice when her skein awakened. I mistakenly identified the voice in my episode one recap as a sign of schizophrenia. But in the book, Allie remembers that the voice has been with her from a young age, and in her final moments in the book, that voice reveals that it is not a hallucination. It is not a delusion. It is ancient. The voice once acted in service of a prophet, who told the voice some of its friends wanted a king. The voice warned what would happen, the same thing its warning will happen if this war moves forward. Allie says, are you trying to tell me there's literally no right choice here. The voice tells Allie, there's never been a right choice, honey bun. The whole idea that there are two things and you have to choose is the problem. And that is the last time Allie ever hears the voice. But that doesn't mean that the voice is gone. It is a force of nature like this game. Who knows, maybe Allie's earlier guess that it's God who caused people to develop this new organ was close, but only half right. The voice is not good or bad. Those words, like man or woman, are just shell games, like the demon passing from one body to the next in that old Denzel Washington movie, Fallen. The voice now passes to a new host. The voice passes to Margot. Some terrible stuff happens to Jocelyn over the course of the story, and every time Jocelyn gets hurt, Margot goes full mama bear and offers a proportional response. When something truly shocking happens to Jocelyn near the end of the book, 
Margot awakens to what she's facing as a mother for Jocelyn and everyone else she sees as worthy of protection. Margot asks, how can we stop it happening again? And the voice says, you can't get there from here. The iconic words that signal Ali's awakening at the beginning of the story. Margot sees it in all that sees it all in that instant, the shape of the tree of power, root to tip, branching and rebranching. Of course, the old tree still stands. There is only one way, and that is to blast it entirely to pieces. Roxy goes to see Allie, who by this time is sort of running her own nation state of rebel, rebel nuns, and says, Roxy says, hey man, put me in charge of the armies in the north before this shit goes to shit. You know, in case Allie hasn't watched that new John Leguizamo interview and heard that people with skeins can focus their power into a nuclear blast. Y'all are going to get everyone killed, or at least send humanity back to the Stone Age. <sighs> so, yep. The book hinted that nuclear war wasn't just imminent, it was what sent humanity back to the Stone Age. The book just never explained who sent the first shot. But if John Leguizamo is to be believed, it wasn't actual nuclear missiles. The blast came from a nation of power who learned to channel their ability into the force of about 300 kilotons. Whether the first shot came from Margot Alley or some dummy who calls himself Babe Truth, only one thing's for sure. When the blast comes, you better hope there's a fridge close by. Anyway, for more recaps of Indiana Jones and the Crystal Skull, subscribe to my Substack. That's a joke, y'all in book spoilers. Now listen, everyone, I am very likely making something out of nothing. Please do not get Don Leguizamo into trouble. It was an innocent comment that probably don't mean nothing. It's a testament. Hey, there's my Margaret Atwood reference for the day to the quality of the power that they can inspire much endless and obsessive specula speculation over whether, where the show is headed by the end of the first season and beyond. As for the rest of John Leguizamo's comments, I literally fist pumped when I heard him declare the power goes to non-binary people too. Cool, huh? No, maybe it's Jocelyn's friend Kat who figures out how to channel an electric charge into a nuclear blast. So y'all, let me know what you think. Let me know whether you think John's comment is foreshadowing where the show is going. Uh, the show thus far has been pretty deliberate about that kind of stuff. Um, in my episode five recap, I made a huge deal about chess pieces and the Zoya and Tatiana flashback. It, it, in that scene, Zoya circles a queen around a rook. I think that's clear foreshadowing. And I thought, wait, did every character get paired with a different chess piece in at least one scene, their introduction? And yep, some of them did. <laughs> <laughs> An early scene between Margo and Daniel Danden takes her to his home where they sit on opposite sides of the chess table. And in this clip, uh, the chess pieces are undisturbed save for that single pawn push forward. Are there any chess experts out there? Does that pawn's placement represent any particular strategy? Y'all, please let me know. Anyway, I'll catch you next time.